Welcome to the Wolverine.com podcast. If you're watching us on the YouTube channel, hit subscribe. Uh, Clayton Safey here with Chris Ballas and Austin Fox. Obviously from the Wolverine.com. Use the promo code BLUE60 over there if you're not with us already. Uh, you can join us on our message board. You can read all of our premium articles, premium content, insider content. Uh, so go do that right now. Promo code BLUE60. But guys, we'll talk about Michigan basketball, which is amid a shutdown right now for up to two weeks, so we can get into that. And then we'll talk about the new offensive staff for Michigan football. Um, but starting with this basketball team that is 8-1 and one in Big Ten play, 13-1 and one overall, number four in the country, one of the best teams in the country, looks like a national title contender, the favorite to win the Big Ten. All of that is shut down, and it's just par for the course, it seems like, in this type of year. But uh, this is the most unique shutdown that I've seen. Uh, this has nothing to do with the actual program that is shut down. They shut down the entire athletic department due to a an Olympic sport athlete going overseas and getting the new strain of the, the COVID virus. So um, shutting the entire thing down here for up to 14 days, and that was kind of shocking news, I guess, on Saturday. Um, uh, your initial thoughts, I guess. Uh, not shocking if you were paying attention on the Wolverine.com. We had an inside the Ford extra that morning that said, hey, this is a real possibility. They were expected to test on Monday, and that was going to be a big day. But all of a sudden, boom, just like that, it got shut down. Uh, I don't get it, and I don't blame one woman, uh, athlete, or anybody else. I blame kind of a, what seems like a knee-jerk decision here. You've got a bunch of kids here who have been following protocol, doing everything asked of them. Uh, and it comes back to how much is too much here? And, and I'm all about Aaron on the side of caution, but uh, this seems absurd to me uh, about what possibly could happen if this, 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 and this happen. Uh, none of those things are happening. Uh, if you look at the testing, I think 22 out of what, 2,200 or 2,400 tests uh, were positive, no staff members. So we're talking about student athletes here who the vast majority are not effective, affected severely by this virus. Uh, and, and I'm not minimizing at all any more than Jawan Howard is. And, and he when he talks about this is real and we need to be erring on the side of caution. But Jawan Howard, from what we've heard behind the scenes, is not pleased. And uh, nor should he be because, man, this guy has done everything and his kids have done everything asked of them to remain safe and to pull the rug out from under them. Who knows how they'll respond in a couple of weeks. And let's be honest, in this day and age, it's not about, you know, wow, championships are in more in perspective and, and sports are more in perspective than they've ever been. But at the same time, man, come on, let's use some common sense here. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Absurd is a great way to put it. The Michigan student athletes spoke out yesterday on social media. They came out with a statement saying that they would love to see the higher ups not only reconsider this decision, but overturn it altogether. It's really a shame it had to happen to these Michigan sports teams who had no positive cases, obviously, being the basketball team first and foremost. They've done everything asked of them. The Michigan basketball players spoke out on Twitter how upset they are about it. Isaiah Livers was one. Hunter Dickinson was another. And they have every right to be because, again, they've handled this perfectly. They've done what's been asked of them. And like you said, they had the rug pulled out from underneath them. It's an absolute shame it had to come to this. Uh, obviously, the next four games are postponed. We'll see if they, they get made up. It's hard to imagine all four being made up. So I don't know how that's going to affect the Big Ten title race when it's all said and done. But yeah, again, I think it's a major, major overreaction, and I hope the administration and the higher-ups reconsider in a big way. And let me add this. It's not just about the revenue sports. You look at the non-revenue sports, I think it's cross-country, right? That's not going to be able to compete, and so they can't, if they don't compete in the Big Ten championships this weekend, then they can't go to nationals and compete in the NCAA titles, at least one of the sports. Uh, women's basketball has been doing a fantastic job as well, so uh, it's, you know, these Basketball is going to be able to continue at some point, and there's so much money involved that, you know, there might be some shutdowns. We saw it at Villanova. We've seen it at Michigan State. Uh, they're going to continue, and they're going to pick back up, and the NCAA tournament's going to go on. They just can't. When there's that much money involved, it's going to happen. But these other sports aren't going to have that opportunity, and these kids work every bit as hard. These athletes work every bit as hard. Uh, as the basketball players, even if they're not in the spotlight that and that NCAA basketball is and everything else. So it uh, really bothers me. And uh, I hope they do reconsider uh, from what we've heard beyond behind closed doors. They aren't going to that February 7th is when they're going to reconsider or consider starting up again. So which would be an awful shame. Uh, hopefully, hopefully they they at least 
are transparent about their their reasoning here and come out and say, okay, here's what we're doing and steps that we're taking to make sure this doesn't happen again and so on and so forth. But at this point, I don't expect it. Yeah, and the, I think the transparency is honestly the most disappointing part because y- you cancel it. I mean, come out and say that, uh, hey, you know, the rest of the athletes here are more susceptible because, you know, a student athlete tested positive or whatever for this new strain or whatever. There's still, you know, the campus is open. It's only athletic shutdown. So I think that's a big nuance that I think they need to come out and actually say something. We, you haven't heard anything from Mark Schlissel. You haven't heard much really from the Department of Health who made this recommendation. And I understand that when a, you know, government department like that makes a recommendation to a public institution, it probably is more of a mandate. You know, it, it's a fine line there, I guess. But at the same time, these are uncharted waters. And if you're the university, I mean, at some point, you got to trust what you were doing, right, with the testing and the social distancing and all that. Um, but, right. yes. Yeah. Yes, right? Follow the science and the data. Haven't they been doing that? Isn't that what they've been told to do? That's what they've been doing. So quit freaking moving the goalposts here. And if they're doing something right, which they are, then you let them continue to do it. And uh, again, zero positive tests among staff members and uh, and a very limited amount among the student athletes. So come on, people, let's uh, what are we doing here? Yeah. And it's not about even that this is such a good Michigan basketball team. You mentioned all the other sports, too. It's just the the principle of the decision just doesn't make sense. And I haven't really seen many people that have said, I, I mean, I haven't seen a good case out there for why just athletics should be shut down. All athletics should be shut down. Uh, I mean, is there a good, like, I'm willing to listen to something here because like we said, I mean, we don't want this thing to spread in Michigan athletics to be the cause of it. We don't want anything to be the cause of it. And if this is something that would, would cause a big outbreak in the, either the athletic community, the university community, or the Ann Arbor, Washtenaw County community, then we'd be all for shutting it down. But when you've gotten this far, I think that's where the frustration comes in. And these guys are safer in their bubbles, their athletic bubbles. And we've said this so many times, even with football, when they go into that building, it is so clean and and they take such extreme measures to make sure that these guys are safe and these these women are safe. Uh, It doesn't make any sense to me. So they think it's more it makes more sense to put these kids and and students in in classrooms and and next to each other and, and having them at parties rather than being sheltered and, and, you know, going where they've been tested like everybody else has just to get in the building, you know, you're going to be safer there for three hours and you are going to a frat party. You're going somewhere else on campus. That's the reality of this. So uh, just stupid. And if somebody could uh, make a compelling case, otherwise I'm willing to listen, but nobody's talking about it. Nobody is saying, okay, well, this is exactly why I get a doctor up there and say, hey, well, it's step A, B, and C, and this is why we're really concerned, instead of, well, there's this one variant strain that may or may not be worse, and so on and so forth. So, and again, not minimizing the the pandemic. Uh, it's real. It's just like Jawan Howard said, you know, we're going to take all steps and all precautions, but they have, and that's the thing that really bugs me the most. We so often hear about, too, how they're saying that they're doing doing it for the health and the well-being of the student athletes. There's no question that it's better for their mental health to be playing these sports. I think every single student athlete on campus would agree with that. Oakland basketball coach Greg Campy put out an incredible letter last night on Twitter. He said the Michigan basketball coaches asked him to do it, but that's not why he's doing it. He's doing it because that's what he believes in, and he's doing it for the players. And if you haven't read it, Go to his Twitter account. Again, it's Greg Campy and read what he said because he was spot on saying that these kids have worked incredibly hard and that it doesn't make sense to shut it down now. So he made it clear that they should absolutely be playing, and he hopes as well that they reconsider the shutdown. Yeah, and I think – was that more specific to uh, high school basketball that got pushed back to at least the 21st, or was that – I think I think it was both, but I think you're right. It was more probably aimed toward high school basketball. Yeah, there's a lot a lot of people right now wanting to. All my Twitter feed is is people saying like, "Let us play, let us play." And again, I don't blame them. And I love that they have their voice. And Austin, you mentioned earlier that letter by the Coalition of Student Athletes at the University of Michigan. Use your voice. I think athletes have a bigger voice right now than ever, and they want to play. And mental health is certainly an issue as well. Um, when you look at what this actually is going to do for Michigan when they do come back, let's assume the 14 days stays, um, they miss the next four games. Then the problem with this is, you know, when a team shuts down, we saw it with Michigan football, they shut down the entire building. But after a while, 
uh, while they still didn't play games, they still had some limited workouts, and the guys who were healthy or not in contact tracing were able to work out and practice and all that. This order right now for Michigan is everybody – you know, nobody can come in the building. Everybody's shut down. They can't meet. They can't work out. They can't lift. They can't practice. They can't shoot around. I mean, I'm sure there's ways around that to go to a local gym. Is that safer? That's another argument. Oh, uh, exactly. So, uh, you know, but this impacts the team in a bigger way than just even the Michigan State shutdown where they had a couple kids positive, where they're still able to come in and, you know, probably follow some more advanced safety measures. But we're looking at a team. Right now, that's a championship level Michigan basketball team, the favorite to win the Big Ten that doesn't get to practice for two weeks in terms of on the court. I guess, what do you guys expect? Because I think it's it's going to take a week or two to get back to that level. And maybe you never do. And I hate to say that. Um, I think this team can. But to say that that's a guarantee that they're going to get back once they knock the rust off, they're going to get back to the level they were playing at or you know, whatever is just, I mean, you can't say that anywhere near a guarantee at this point. No, you can't. And that's the disappointing part of it as well. And probably why Juwan Howard is so upset from what we've heard. And and I want to make something clear too. I do believe that Ward Manuel is going to bat for his programs and that this is not an athletic department decision and that they're, they've said, okay, you know, come on. You know, I think he's saying and thinking the same things. We are not to speak for him, but you know, I've seen a lot of people out there saying, oh, this is Ward Manuel's fault and he needs to do this and do that. You don't know what he's doing. And, and I, I think that uh, I don't think there's any question that they want to get these guys back playing. So as long as it's safe, which, again, they probably think, uh, not speaking for them, but uh, if they're looking at what we're looking at, you know, they probably think it's logical that they should be out there, too. But it is disappointing because, man, you're talking about an opportunity here. They're eight and one now. They could have been 12 and one after the next four games, man, with seven games to go. And everybody's talking about that gauntlet down the stretch of teams that they have to play. Well, they get Iowa and Illinois at home in those. Going to Wisconsin is going to be the toughest game left on the schedule. Uh, it looks like a logical loss, even though they just destroyed Wisconsin the first time around. That's a well-coached team. That Their pride was hurt uh, when they played Michigan. But uh, no guarantee you beat Michigan State uh, twice, uh, I think. Uh, you know, Even though they're a better team, uh, we've seen worse Michigan State teams beat better Michigan teams three times in one year, as a matter of fact, you know, um, just a few years ago when Michigan should have won a championship. So uh, it's it's going to be interesting to see how the Big Ten handles it. Let's put it that way. I don't think you're going to see the, the conference tournament canceled. That's been a big question. I think you're going to see it move to Indianapolis, which I think it should be. Everything's going to be in Indiana, and I think that's kind of cool, including the NCAA tournament. But uh, right now, you know, they've got to find ways to, you know, either go to local gyms or do do whatever they can to stay in shape. And I'm sure that John Sanderson, who's one of the best in the business as a strength coach, is going to have these guys working out. But you're right, man. They've got the momentum, and, and it is hard to get that back, man. When you go off for two weeks, uh, who knows how they're going to respond. I think there's enough character on this team and enough leadership that they're going to be okay after a while. But, man, it stinks to see this happen. Yeah, there's no guarantees at all that they'll eventually get back to the level that they're at right now. I think you make a good point with the character and the mindset of this group. I think eventually they'll get back to a similar level, but there's bound to be rust once they start playing again, especially when considering it's going to be the meat of the schedule with Illinois on February 11th and then Rutgers and Ohio State and a trip to Wisconsin soon after that. But yeah, it's a shame that this uh, shutdown had to occur now and basically derails everything. Uh like you said, this is one of the best Michigan teams that we've ever seen. I think this is on par with those 2013 and 2018 teams that went to the national title, if not better. I don't think we've ever really seen a Michigan team in recent history consistently blow out opponents the way they are nowadays. So, But again, I think this group has a lot of character with, obviously, Juwan Howard first and foremost. And I think that by the time mid to late February rolls around, hopefully they can get to at least a similar level that they were at before the shutdown occurred. Gut feeling. You guys think this team still still wins the Big Ten? I know we don't know exactly what's going to happen and when they'll return, but uh, what do you think? I do. I think that they're the best team in the Big Ten. I think uh, Iowa going to Iowa. You know, they're going to give away games that they shouldn't, and they're not going to defend. Uh, when I'm looking at the Kempom efficiency ratings for offense and defense, and Michigan's what third and seventh, I think third defensively or something, or seventh and sixth. It's yeah, it moves a little bit. Yeah, let's put it let's put it that way. Uh, the way they're defending now, the way they play as a team, the way that they are moving the ball uh, against really good basketball teams, man, uh, it is tough to imagine this team losing 
uh, you know, four or five, six games in the Big Ten. I think three, I think four wins, five wins can still win this league. But I'm looking at the schedules, and I wrote this for the magazine. I'm going down the list. Illinois got tough games. Ohio State's got tough games. They're one to watch because they've got probably the easiest uh, path, in my opinion, down the stretch. And they're a pretty good basketball team, even though I think they've got four losses already. Um, Iowa has tough games. Illinois and Iowa have one game against Michigan, and guess where it is? It's in Ann Arbor. Uh, I like Michigan's chances against those teams. Now, Ohio State is the one that gets Michigan once, and they get them at home, so that'll be a big game. But I think Michigan will have opened up a big enough lead that they could survive a couple of losses here and still win this thing, assuming they come back and uh, kick the rust off. But, man, what a kick in the groin that was. Yeah, there's no question they're in the driver's seat right now. They're the best offensive team in the entire country from a field goal percentage standpoint among power conference teams, and they're the third best defensive team among uh, power conference teams, which is absolutely incredible. Uh, You talked about the schedule a little bit. How's it going to play out if Michigan doesn't play the same amount of games that some of these other teams play? I don't think they're going to play 20 conference games. Uh, I don't see how all four of these postponements get made up, but to answer your question, yeah, I think they will win the Big Ten title. Iowa's going to Iowa. Like you said, they're bound to lose a few games. They probably shouldn't. They already did that this past Thursday when they lost to Indiana at home in a pretty big upset. Wisconsin is showing some uh, major weaknesses lately. Ohio State really took it to them at the Kohl Center this past Saturday. So, again, to answer your question, I think Michigan will be your Big Ten champs. Yeah, I uh, I hate to say this. I don't think that they will anymore because of this. I I think it's going to be tougher. No team's ever really gone through this when you look at, at least from a Michigan standpoint. But if I had to pick one team to win it, it would be Michigan. Um, But I would take the field at this point. And and, and that's not, that was not the case on Friday night before all this happened. But um, I I think this is going to be rougher to, to handle than a lot of people think. But at the same time, this is the exact moment, I guess you would want to have this. This is the latest date you would want to have something like this happened because I think they can get back into true form before March um, when they do play Iowa and then they go into the big 10 tournament and then they go into the NCAA tournament. But uh, this is going to be fascinating, really fascinating to watch. And it's disappointing that we're in this spot, but it will be fascinating to see exactly how this all plays out. Um, Let's get to, uh, let's get to football with some of the staff changes. Uh, Chris, you've been talking about and reporting on all these different staff changes that have been possibilities for Michigan. They were looking for help. At the offensive coordinator spot, they got it with, you know, promoting Sharon Moore there to the co-offensive coordinator. Ed Warner is out at least as an on-field coach. Um, Sharon Moore moving to offensive line. Jay Harbaugh to tight ends. Ron Bellamy from West Bloomfield in at wide receivers, former Michigan uh, receiver himself. We've talked about the Mike Hart hire. We've talked about Jim Harbaugh coaching quarterbacks. Um, But your guys' thoughts, I guess, on this new offensive staff, which – you know, I'm a little hesitant on this Ed Warner thing. I, I thought he was a, a very, very good coach. Uh, I think Sharon Moore is a rising star as a coach, but uh, there's so much that goes into offensive line play that, it, you know, it's kind of scary to have a first-time offensive line coach as well as a young coordinator and all that. But if there's anybody who can rise up and, and kind of do that, I think it's a guy who's on a significant climb here as an assistant football coach in the, in the profession. And has played the position at a high level at Oklahoma, right? So, I mean, he's uh, – Sharon Moore is a, is a good coach, uh, flat out. We know that, uh, I think. I think he's a great recruiter. I think he's a good coach. Uh, how will he respond? I don't know. You know, it's a lot of people have – kind of guess that maybe Mike DeBoard as an analyst can come over and help him in practice. You know, Mike DeBoard has been here in the past. If he's still with the program, we've heard that some analysts have gotten the broom, um, you know, who knows, but uh, it, it is kind of a head scratcher. Uh, Ed Warner, I thought did a really good job here. And I think a lot of former offensive linemen who played here thought he did a good job here. Uh, and if he got the boot because people didn't like him or kids didn't like his style, you know, because he was too hard on them, then, for God's sake, you're never going to win Jack here. Uh, let's be honest. I was talking to Doug Skeen, Michigan's former All-Big Ten offensive lineman, about playing for less miles and how much they would get beaten down. And he said, I hated that guy. He made me better. He made me who I was. And if guys can't take it, man, uh, maybe that's an indication that you're recruiting the wrong kids. Or, uh, you know, that's just that's what first comes to mind for me. But uh, I understand we're a little bit old school, and we, but we've seen what has won championships here in the past before you guys were born. Uh, unbelievable it's been 16 years Austin was probably in diapers or Clayton at the time that Michigan won its last championship but 
it was actually happened quite a bit and they were in contention every year guys that's the main thing uh, and that's where they need to get back and are these the moves that are going to make you better when you look at them on a national scale against for example the moves that Nick Saban makes in bringing the best of the best in it doesn't compare uh, and you know Mike Hart I like him a lot as the running backs coach um, you know is Josh Gaddis good enough as as your offensive coordinator I guess we're going to find out uh, so um, but lots to prove guys the one thing I will say is that Jim Harbaugh what I wrote in my column this week has enough fodder now with Ohio State fans and Michigan State fans and everybody else celebrating his return, that if he doesn't become the jackhammer again, then he never will. Dan, you, sorry, Austin, but yeah, uh, the Doug Marone move as the offensive line coach for Alabama is unbelievable. And I'm sure Harbaugh would do it if he could. Who who would not go to Alabama if you're Doug Marone? I'll go there for a year and get another gig somewhere. Unbelievable. Former head coach of the Jags right. is going there. Yeah. I was 14 years old and in junior high the last time uh, Michigan won their last Big Ten title. So to answer your question, I was at least born. But uh, the Ed Warner departure is the biggest takeaway for me on this whole offensive staff, staff shakeup, at least from an offensive line standpoint, because he did do an incredible job with that 2018 Michigan offensive line that was so bad the year before he arrived. And he did a good job as a recruiter. He brought in that outstanding 2019 recruiting class that featured five four-star offensive linemen. And I think the Ron Bellamy hire is a pretty darn good one, mainly from a recruiting standpoint. I think he's well-respected around the Detroit area. And I actually spoke with Cast Tech head coach Thomas Wilcher this past offseason, and he was on a Zoom call with Sharon Moore, who said that one of their primary goals is to build that relationship with high schools in Detroit and make sure they recruit the area a lot better. So I think Ron Bellamy will help quite a bit in that regard. We've talked about the Mike Hart hire a lot. I think that's a home run hire. I actually spoke with former Indiana running back Morgan Ellison recently who played for Hart in 2017, and he raved about Mike Hart not only as a coach but as a person. He said accountability was the name of the game at Indiana, and he made sure that guys were held accountable, and it was a family atmosphere, and I think that's something the Michigan football program could really use. So all in all, I don't have any issues with these Michigan staff moves, and I think the Ron Bellamy and Mike Hart moves are the best ones that Jim Harbaugh's made. I forgot to mention Ron Bellamy. I love Ron Bellamy, uh, class act. He has always been a great go-to and has always been honest and straightforward. We talked for about an hour in the summer, and uh, the things that he said, I would, I thought then, this guy is a rising star in this profession. The way that he handles kids and mentors kids, uh, who he is as a person, but I think he's a great coach, and I think he understands what needs to be done when it comes to recruiting as well. Uh, and I think he's a guy that can bring, a, a, give him a shot in the arm in that respect as well. So great hire there. I love, uh, Skeen once said, probably 20 years ago, he said, there's something that makes me feel better, sleep better at night, knowing that there are guys that won championships in that building, helping mentor these kids. You know, we thought maybe with Brady Hoke, that would be the case. I thought his staff around him was certainly one of his weak points and he didn't bring enough of those guys with him or he might've been more successful, but I'm with Skeen, man. These guys understand it. They get it. Mike Hart was on the last championship team that Michigan had. Ryan Bellamy won championships here. So I really love these two hires. Mm -hmm. And I've talked to Ron Bellamy a few times over the last few months covering some of the West Bloomfield games, obviously with Donovan Edwards. And I was talking to him on signing day about, uh, you know, he said he'd never pushed Donovan to, to Michigan. And he always was willing to listen. And he took him down to Ohio State and said, you know, because this is basically like a second father to, to Donovan Edwards with a really close relationship. Uh, but he said it did make him happy that when he found out he was going to choose Michigan and he loves Michigan. And he said, you know, him and him and Jim Harbaugh have a great relationship and he was happy to send one of his kids there. Now he's happy to be the wide receivers coach at Michigan. And I agree with you having guys with the championship pedigree. Uh, Jim Harbaugh hasn't done it as a coach, but he's, he's done it as a player and surrounding himself with other guys that have been there. Um, you know, Mike Hart won a, a hell of a lot of games at Michigan, and, and he was one of the big reasons why Ron Bellamy's been there. Uh, Sharon Moore, you, you mentioned that earlier, played offensive line, played offensive tackle at a really high level, blocking for Adrian Peterson at Oklahoma. Um, so you have some guys, Maurice Linguis on the defensive side, who I think was hired after we did our last one, uh, just seems like a jackhammer you want to use that word on the recruiting yep. trail with the way he got to work before he was even announced as the uh, corners coach and co-defensive coordinator so they're bringing in the youth what do you guys think about that too the philosophy here 
seems to be. I, I think the average age now of Michigan's assistant coaches is 36. It was 46 last year. So there's an obvious trend there where they're trying to get more energetic, more youthful, uh, focus on recruiting a little bit. I, you know, I don't know if it's going to necessarily give them, you mentioned like the shot in the arm right away because recruiting something that is a process and it's going to take some years. But um, he said, you know, Jim Harbaugh said a couple of weeks ago when he was uh, speaking at that uh, coach's clinic that every decision he makes is going to be for the betterment of the program and not for his own job security. Uh, I give him credit in that respect that it seems like it seems to be that his focus and he's kind of sticking to that. Whether it pays off again, we're going to have to wait till September. Sounds to me like you don't like old people. That's what it sounds like. You just want the old me? guys. Uh, yeah, absolutely. You're an ageist. So <laughs> just kidding, man. I'm saying uh, you don't have to be young to be a, uh, an energetic recruiter. But True. Uh, I will say this. I mean, Greg Madison, when he first got here, I thought was a great recruiter. When he first got here the second or third time or whatever, you know, for Brady Hoke, I thought did a really nice job on the recruiting trail. But uh, there's something to be said for the relatability uh, when it comes to guys like Sharon Moore, who's an outstanding recruiter, linguist. Uh, another guy I failed to mention who is an outstanding recruiter from everything we've heard. This guy uh, gets it done on the recruiting trail, and you can see it. You can see it already in some of the results and not landing the kids, but getting in with kids that Michigan wasn't in with before. So I like that aspect of it. Uh, you got to be able to coach too, and I'm not saying you can't, but. That's uh, bringing in talent. It's great, and you win with talent. But you got to have guys that can coach them off if you want to win. And we've seen that. Uh, that hasn't. I thought they they did a great job in Jim Harbaugh's first couple of years. Uh, I've seen kind of a steady decline there in accountability and uh, and culture. And culture is the big thing. And hopefully these young guys, guys like Hart and Bellamy, who played on those again when the culture was really really good here under Lloyd Carr. People can say whatever they want to about Lloyd. That's big, and I think that's going to certainly help. Yeah, I like the youth aspect, too. I think um, the majority of athletes nowadays want to play for guys like that, guys they can relate to and really who aren't that much older than them. Not to knock some of the older Michigan coaches on the staff, but I don't think they were known as relentless recruiters or even some of the past assistant coaches that Harbaugh's brought in. A lot of the football factories around the country will oftentimes hire some of these assistants who are great recruiters first and then elite coaches secondhand. So, I think guys like young coaches like Mike Hart and Linguist and some of the other guys just flat out get it and will be relentless on the recruiting trail, specifically Mike Hart, who, again, played here and knows what it takes to be a Michigan athlete and knows what it takes to win at a high level. Yeah, and when you when you speak of Mike Hart, it's not like Mike Hart's not a hard ass either. When I was talking to – I was at the Sound Mind, Sound Body camp last week, and I was talking to a couple uh, high school coaches from the Detroit area who know him well. One coach – uh, Rod Oden from Harper Woods, he sent a kid to play for Mike Hart at Syracuse, Western Michigan, Eastern Michigan, Indiana. And he's like, yeah, I'll probably send a kid to Michigan too. And he's happy to do it because Mike Hart tells them in the recruiting process exactly what's what, what it's going to be like. And he said the kids don't transfer because they know what they're getting themselves into. Um, so it's not like these guys aren't going to hold them accountable either. Ron Bellamy is the same way where, um, you know, just observing him as a coach on the sideline in his high school games, He'll light into these kids, but they love him. And I think that's maybe what was missing. Maybe with some of these guys that are great talent developers or whatever, but if you can't get through to a kid, then it's all at a loss. Now it could be a overarching. And I know uh, Chris, you and Bal or you and uh, Skeen talk about this quite a bit, just kind of how different it maybe is from 20, 30 years ago. And I guess it's just the way it is. I guess maybe you have to adapt and learn to do it. You've seen some of the better coaches in college football, like, Nick Saban, adapt or die. And he's done that with his staff. And if this is just the next step for Michigan, I think it can be, you know, it can be, a, it could pay off huge. It could backfire, but their back's against the wall. They had to do something. And I think it's, it looks like it can turn out to be good. I hope so. Uh, you know, and I don't think this is a one year deal for everybody saying, well, they kicked the can down the road a year and they're going to get rid of them because you're signing guys to two year contracts and you're giving them the assurance that, hey, they're going to have a chance to rebuild this thing. There is some talent on this team more than anything that needs to start with changing the culture uh, and getting some defensive linemen. For God's sake, get some defensive linemen in here and uh, going to need some linebackers as well. They need some talent at different positions. I think the offensive line's in good shape. I think the receiver core is in pretty good shape. I think you've got running backs now. Uh, there's some talent on this team, but they're going to need to reload a little bit on defense. But more than anything, get back to playing. 
the way that the basketball team plays for each other and not with one eye on, you know, what am I doing next here? Play for each other and play to win for God's sake, play for the winged helmet and, and uh, you know, quit putting yourself first and quit recruiting guys like that. If you have to not, you know, if you get a five star in here and things start going poorly for him and his mommy and daddy call up and saying, Oh, you're not using Jimmy, right? Well then maybe Jimmy needs to get the hell out. So that's the way I feel about it. That's hypothetical there. That's a hypothetical. There's nobody on the team that I know that's named Jimmy that was a five star. So I think the broken culture is spot on everything you just said in that regard. There are some risks with some of these moves that Harbaugh has made. Mike McDonald's never been a defensive coordinator before. Sharon Moore has never been an offensive coordinator, but that's not uh, to say that it's automatically not going to work out. You look at some of the coordinators around the country. And some of the top guys basically came from nothing in a lot of ways. Joe Brady at LSU in 2019 was an offensive genius. And I believe the year before he got to LSU, he was an offensive quality control assistant or whatever it was somewhere, some notch really far down the totem pole with the New Orleans Saints. So you got to start somewhere. So it's not to say that these moves won't work out and they better work out in regards to Harbaugh's future. And uh, I'm cautiously optimistic moving into next season in regards to a lot of these moves that Harbaugh has made. Certainly helps to have elite talent too, guys, uh, when you've got uh, Joe Burrow or, or whatever. And uh, it just, you know, to me, that's where it starts. So hopefully J.J. McCarthy's the guy. Hopefully Cade McNamara steps up. Hopefully Donovan Edwards is as good as we think he is. Uh, Xavier Worthy, uh, you know, the, the young receivers, A.J. Henning. So to me, that's where it starts, coaching them up to be the best they can be. And, and it helps to have a guy like Odell Beckham handing out hundred dollar bills too to your players and keep them happy. So not even in McDonald's bags, baby. Yeah. Just right there in the open. So crazy. Uh, before we go, Tom Brady, uh, I'm wearing his jersey. Um, my virtual background is Raymond James Stadium, the host of Super Bowl Fifty Five. Uh, it never gets old to watch this guy. And anyone that thought the Packers was go- were going to win that game, uh, I think they were quickly reminded again that this guy's still still here. Hashtag still here. <laughs> Unbelievable, man. Uh, he eats at Mr. Spots, too, by the way. I got to give Spots a plug. No, I don't get paid for it, but I would encourage people to support local business in this time. I know too many of my friends that have been struggling. Lots going out of business, and those Spots are still doing pretty well, and I hope they will continue to do well, Keith and Tim. Uh, Tom Brady has eaten there and would have eaten there again this year, but it was Christmas time. Uh, would have brought his lineman some wings when he was in town to play the Lions. How can you not root for this guy unless you're not a Michigan fan, I guess, or or a fan of any other team? Because uh, what he's done is remarkable. 43 years old. If he goes through Breeze, Rodgers, and Mahomes to win this championship, uh, that will be an, an unbelievable feat. I thought it was just a, a feat to get through New Orleans to get to the championship game. I didn't think they would beat Green Bay. wasn't positive, but, man, I think we know now not to bet against this guy. And for anybody who sits there and uh, disparages him, this guy is of the highest character. Uh, you know, everybody I've spoken with, still the same guy, still a great family guy. What Nothing he does is for show, guys. Everything is pretty genuine about him. Yeah, he's a class act all the way. The ideal role model when it comes to athletes and uh, athletes that kids should look up to. At 43 years old, he threw 40 touchdown passes this past year, and that was the second most of his entire career behind the 50 he threw in 2007. He's 6-3 and three all-time in Super Bowls, and I would love to see him get another one uh, in two weeks against the Chiefs. I don't know if he will, but, man, that would just solidify his legacy as the greatest of all time, which really isn't even a debate anymore anyway. Yeah, I mean, he's got as many NFC championships now as Rodgers and Breeze, each of them. I mean, it's he just goes over to the NFC and just does the same thing. It's amazing. I hope he gets another one so he has uh, as many as both of them combined. That would be Perfect. amazing. And I'll say this about Drew Brees, another class act. I don't know about Aaron Rodgers, but I can say I think Drew Brees is as well. So, uh, But it's been fun to watch, guys. I can't wait to sit till the Super Bowl. Sounds good. Yep, we'll probably do this again before then. We can uh, maybe do a little prediction there, but uh, check us out at the Wolverine.com promo code blue 60 for two months of our premium content for free. We'll see everybody next time.